good morning, and welcome to New Revival. If you're new here, my name is, because I'm looking out and I'm trying to figure out who's new here. If you are new here, uh, my name is uh, Pastor Clint. I'm one of the uh, pastors here at New Revival. I have the blessing of bringing you God's Word today. So we are in the second week in a series in the book of Haggai, right? I know, so we're, we're, doing, we're in this book of Haggai. It's a minor prophet, right? It's just a tiny prophet in the Old Testament, and of course he's not tiny. Uh, and his words are obviously incredibly significant. But this is where we're spending the next uh, this week and then next week. Um, I want to share that with you this morning because I absolutely love creative people. I like to think I'm a creative person, but I mean, maybe in some things, but I don't know. I mean, I certainly couldn't do anything, anything like that. But definitely some of my greatest inspiration in life has come over the years from people who are not only deeply spiritual – but also tremendously gifted and creative, and they can look at something like a blank canvas, and they can just create something, you know, absolutely incredible. I read once that sometimes artists just look at things differently. They will look at a blank canvas, and they will get a vision of what they want to paint, and then they will eliminate stroke by stroke the part that doesn't match that vision. I think that's actually kind of cool. Creative <laughs> people are just are awesome. We, we need them, right? I mean, if you look around the world today, though, we see what? In the name of uh, art or creativity, we see that there's a lot of evil that kind of takes place, and we see it, right? Under the guise of art, Satan is very clever. So in the same sense, though, right, where, where, where evil exists, grace abounds more. Where sin exists, grace abounds more. And so we see that there is also this equal... Um, artistic impression, like the one we just saw, that just celebrates the goodness of God. You can see this, and we were talking about this this week, about the architecture. Uh, I think Ted and I were talking about the architecture that comes from people just having this incredible relationship with God, and they build these incredible buildings and churches, and it's just, it's awesome. It's, it's an architectural artist, and they're just building this massive, amazing structure, and they're doing it because they're inspired by God to do so. Same with some of the greatest sculptures we have, and certainly some paintings like some of the ones I showed you last week. Do you realize, though, that as we have, we have creative people in our midst, we also serve a creative, a creative God. In fact, a master artist God is. Did you also know that you are his greatest masterpiece? You are his greatest work of art. In fact, Ephesians 2.10 says this, For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. I'm glad God is at the helm. I'm glad he's a great artist. And I'm glad that he is planning things for me in my future. And I pray that you, that you are too. So we're studying God's Word in the book of Haggai. So if you're not there uh, and you got your Bible with you today or you want to scroll there on your Bible app, you can go to Haggai. It's just three prophets back from the end of the Old Testament. He's considered what's one of 12 minor prophets. Uh, and as I said, although they're minor, um, is, there, is, there, um, is there a title? There's nothing minor about what God has to say in and through them. So just to kind of bring you up to speed if you weren't here uh, last week, what's going on in Haggai actually fits into the book of Ezra historically. So you can go look into detail in Ezra. You can see what's going on here in Haggai. But God is speaking through the prophet Haggai specifically to the people of Israel that are returning from captivity. So they've been in captivity in Babylon for 70 years, and their temple has been destroyed the temple that Solomon built, this beautiful temple built by the richest man that ever lived. All of the, the, the gold and silver and every adornment that could possibly be had been destroyed. Now they're back, and God wants them to rebuild this temple. The problem is, is they're facing some opposition. They're facing the opposition from the outside, because if you read through Ezra, where you can see that there are some people that from the northern tribes that are coming down saying, hey, we want to you know, we want to partner with you, but they don't really want to partner with them. They kind of want to take them off track. And when they say no, they begin to litigate against them. So there's like 
the, you know, the building code inspector comes and says, yeah, he shuts it down. You, know, you can't do it. So there's all litigation, and so this is discouraging to them from their outside, from the opposition. What it does is it sparks some fear internally in them. And they start to think, okay, well, maybe we just won't touch that. That seems to be a problem for everybody around us, although that's what God wants them to build. So fear builds up inside of them. Maybe they're a little complacent. They start to look at their own house, and they say, well, we got some material. Why don't we just build our own houses? This makes God a little angry. He says, look, why are you building these incredible houses for yourself when my house, God's house, sits, sits in ruin? And then Haggai is this first mouthpiece of God after their captivity, after this time in Babylon. And he tells them, look, you've got to get to work on this temple. And he assures them, he says, I will be with you. And then as we read last week, the Lord proceeds to stir up their spirit. And I just can't get that visual out of my head of God stirring up the spirit of his people. I think it's so incredible. Today we're going to see how God is going to give the people a full picture a full picture, a vision of this second temple and help them understand that even though they don't see, because they don't see a beautiful temple in front of them being created, in fact, some of them look at it and they say, it's not as grand as the first one, those that saw it, but what they see is much different than what God sees. God sees a finished work. In fact, God sees a finished work that's going to exist long after this generation in Haggai has come and gone. The beginning of the second chapter of Haggai uh, the prophet, is about promise. It's about the promise of hope that God, even when we can't quite see it, listen, God plans, his plans always include a promise of hope and help. A promise of hope and help. Help for what we're dealing with in the present and hope for sometimes what we cannot see or even fathom in the future. So, if you're there already, we can go to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, we start in verse 1, and reading out of the NLT uh, this morning. And in verse 1 it says this, Then on October 17th, that same year, the Lord sent another message through the prophet Haggai. Say this to Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and to the remnant of God's people in the land. Does anyone remember this house, this temple, in its former splendor? So there are people, there are people, obviously, that have been uh, and seen that first temple. And God is speaking to some of those individuals. And he's saying, do you remember what it looks like? He continues to say, how in comparison does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But now, the Lord says, be strong, Zerubbabel. Be strong, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people still left in the land. And now get to work, for I am with you. The two things you want to pull out, there are two exclamations by God. Be strong, which you'll see throughout Scripture, and I am with you, which we saw, of course, last week and talked much about. He says, I am with you. I am with you, says the Lord of Heaven's army. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt. So do not, do not be afraid. You see, these people would have known the story and the history that they were taken out of Egypt by God through a man named Moses. So Moses leads them out of captivity. God helps them along their journey and he brings them to the promised land, this would all be something that's very, very familiar to them. God is reminding them here of that promise. He's saying, just as I promised to be with you then, I promise I will be with you now. Listen, some of us have been in our own Egypt. Maybe you're going through that now, right? You're just in a place where you feel like you're in captivity. Like you, you, you're stifled. You can't move forward. Maybe it's in your faith. Maybe it's in a relationship. Maybe it's in a job. I don't know what it is for you. But maybe it's in Egypt that God is seeking to say to you, I am with you. I am with you in this moment. 
I am with you in these troubles that you're having with your children. I am with you in these troubles that you're having at work. I am with you in all things. And he's trying to pull you out of that Egypt because he has a greater work that he wants to do in and through you. And he says, come with me. I am with you. Here's your first message point today. Hope is God's promise of a better tomorrow birthed out of the trials of today. It's a promise of a better tomorrow birthed out of the trials of of today, One of the greatest gifts that we receive some, from Scripture is the ability to look back in order to look forward or move forward with hope. God does this over and over again. And he wants these people to remember. He wants them to remember how he, was helped, how he helped them in the past. He wants to reassure them that the same Spirit of God is still with them. And he encourages them to what? To not be Afraid. That same God is saying those same things to us today. I am with you. I am with you. Be strong. Have courage. Don't be afraid. How many of you have like endeavored to complete a big project? Like you may be at work. So maybe you're working. I just use kind of me as an example. You know, I write a lot. Obviously, I write at least you know one big thing for Sunday morning. So, you know, I do writing and I do some other things as well. But let's say, you know, you're writing something, you've got a deadline. My deadline is 10 a.m. Sunday morning. So, so sometimes throughout the week I sit down in front of a computer and I look at a blank piece of paper. Sometimes I look at that blank piece of paper for a little too long. You know, and it becomes a little daunting and it starts to weigh on my mind a little bit. My mind, you know, is a little bit blank. I almost always at least put one word on it. You know what it is? Intro. That's it. And as long as I get that far, I know I feel accomplished somehow, right? You have to start, at least. But sometimes I'm like, oh, and it just takes a while for that, that to happen. Maybe that's you. You know, Maybe you have some deadlines at work and you're trying to get them and it's like, oh, it's just this constant pressure, right? We feel that. We know that. Maybe you're, you work with your hands. Maybe you're trying to build something. Have you ever built anything from the hell Ikea in New York? Okay, so if you've never been to Ikea or bought anything from Ikea, it comes in a billion pieces, right? A billion pieces. It's worse than like the Barbie Playhouse when you had to put it together when you, you knew your daughters were going. But, it, it, I mean, maybe you're trying to put something complicated like this together, and you got a picture of it, first of all. you got directions of it, and you're thinking, okay, I see this vision, and you're trying to accomplish it, but somehow something comes, you know, ends up coming on, on backwards. It just doesn't come to fruition, right? It's so, so frustrating. I really appreciate people that have the ability to do that, that have the vision to, to see something and just build it and build things. I, I heard this story this week about a man, maybe you've heard this before, standing outside a store and he's watching another man. And this guy was whittling these, these little dogs. And this guy was really good, really good at his craft apparently. And he would take this piece of wood and he would methodically, without hesitation, he would make this perfectly shaped little wooden dog and then he would hand this dog out to bystanders kind of as a gift, you know? Kind of a cool idea. And then the man that was watching over this, he was amazed by it. And when the whittler stopped to take a break, the man asked the artist, he said, tell me, how do you do that? Like, I could never do that. How do you do that? And he paused for a moment, the, the, the artist, and he looked at the piece of wood in his hands, and he said, well, I take a piece of wood, and I look at it, and I just get, out, get rid of every part of it that doesn't look like a dog. I mean, that seems to make sense, right? Seems pretty simple. But most of us take a look at a piece of wood, and we don't see a dog. We see a piece of wood. But an artist sees something, an artist sees something much, much different. The people of God, listen, have been working and rebuilding the temple for a month. They've been working for about a month, and it's not going particularly well. It pales in comparison to the previous temple. As like I said, some of those had seen it. And, and this one just looks unimpressive. It kind of looks underwhelming. It kind of looks incomplete. And I think if you look at this picture of this temple, compare it to the previous temple. And maybe we look at our own lives and our own faith and our own journey and our own walk with God. And we can think, you know, maybe... What I'm doing is not that really impressive. Surely there's more spiritual people than me. You know, maybe it's just a little underwhelming. 
Maybe I could stand up here and stand up. So I'm, so, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's preaching better than me today, right? This sermon might be underwhelming compared to the guy that's on TV preaching. You know what I mean? You can play that comparison game. Maybe, maybe that's you know, something that, that, that's happening. But I think sometimes we can look at ourselves in this way. We have a negative view of ourselves. Maybe we're trying to please God, but we continually are getting discouraged. Anybody have that problem? Right? It comes in different ways. Sometimes it can come from somebody in your family. You can be discouraged by somebody in your family, or they're just simply not encouraging. You keep inviting them to go to church because it's something you want to share with them. They're like, no, I'm not going. I don't want to go. And they're just animate about it. I mean, that's just, that happens. And you're just trying to minister to them. You're trying to help them. You're trying to show them the, the love of God, and they're just not having it. They're just not feeling it. And maybe they're even being judgmental. Judgmental. Maybe it's because we struggle, struggle sometimes internally. You know, uh, there's a phrase that says, um, the phrase is, you're your own worst enemy, right? Do you know that is completely false? You are not your own worst enemy. Believe me, you are not. You, you might step on your own toes from time to time, but you, listen, are fighting a real enemy, and the real enemy is, is Satan. When you're trying to build your faith, here's what Satan does. Satan shows you the areas where you fail or where you feel are unimpressive. He puts a magnifying glass over them. He says, oh, see this? Oh, see this? Oh, you really can do very well over here. That's not what God does, right? But that's what he does. That's what he does when you're trying to move forward. He shows you your sin or he shows you the destruction, right? The fallout that may have happened because of it. It's played over like a reel, like a Facebook reel, over and over, over and over in your mind. And it can be paralyzing. It can be, but it doesn't need to be. Here's some encouragement for you. And it's your second point. When you see sin and shame, God sees Jesus' name. God sees Jesus' name. He doesn't disagree with the assessment. He says, okay, there might be a mess here, but guess what? I want to turn your mess into a message, right? I want to turn your test into a testimony. I want to take you from where you are here, right? Because he'll always meet people where they're at, but he'll never leave them there. He will take them to a better place, right? I want to make things new. I want to make you a new creation. I don't want you to hold on to any of the old. I want you to be a new creation in Christ. Jesus, God agrees with the assessment of them here at the temple. He says, yeah, it's a little underwhelming. It's not as great as the first one, but he doesn't leave them in their despair. He doesn't leave them there. Remember, God is a master artist. He's a master artist, and he paints vivid pictures in his word. And although he acknowledged the reality of what they see, he seeks to give them a greater vision of the future for this temple. Now you might be saying, can you grab that for me real quick? I forgot my little bag. You might be saying this as we're kind of going through this. Sorry, late man, I'm on vacation. <laughs> Keep going. That's all part of the plan. So as we're kind of going through this, I think since this is an Old Testament passage, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, I asked the Old Testament, you know, I'm the New Testament guy. And that's fine, right? But it's, it's all important and it all, it all, it's all there, you know, it's from beginning to the end. You know, you can find Jesus in the Old Testament, you know that, right? You can actually find him in the first page. So if somebody tells you, well, I don't, I don't read the Old Testament. Well, you need to because you won't understand the New Testament if you don't. If you won't understand the Old Testament, you don't read the New. It's important. It's important. But you might be going through, like, like we're in Haggai. I mean, come on. How many people have studied Haggai before? You're like, no. What is that? I can find that. Thankfully, it's just toward the end. It's sort of the buried between you know, 50 other different prophets. Well, I can find it, okay. But maybe you're thinking to yourself, look, I get it. I understand they're building a temple. That's great, but we're not building a temple, right? We're not building a church. We're here like this church in a box. We're, we're a church plant. We're, we're moving to and fro. You know, we're not building anything. We're certainly not building a temple of, of God. You might be saying, you know, that's a cool story, but what does it have to do with me? I always speak to you. 1 Corinthians 3. 16 through 17, where it says this. Apostle Paul writes this to the church in Corinth. He says, do you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys this temple. Protection. For God's temple is holy 
and you are that temple. Now I have a very academic illustration for you using these incredibly academic tools that I found in my grandson's toy box <laughs> called the Duplo Block. Okay, so let's just, for illustration purposes, for those of you that are like me that just need word pictures, okay, I'm just going to show you this, right? Let's just say this is you, right? You're like a block in the temple of God. You're a brick in the temple of God. Let's say this is you. We'll just start with my wife. We'll say, Pastor, Pastor Michelle, right here. This is Michelle. She'll be there, right? And we'll say this one is, we'll say Judy. And then we'll say this one, right? And we'll say this one's Wayne, right? And then we'll go back here. We'll say this one's Amy. And then we'll say this one's uh, Darren. And then we'll say this one is, um, gosh, I don't know, uh, AJ. And then we'll say this one is, um, I I don't know, somebody else back there. Who is it? What's your name? Who's out there? Me. I don't, there you go. You. Easy. That was easy. Okay, so this is you, right? This is you. And so your body, right, is a temple for the Holy Spirit. So each of us here are believers in Jesus, right? Personally. I don't think I thought anybody out there was it that I know of. But each of us are believers in Jesus, right? We're all here. We're all a part of this temple. And then at the base of this temple, the Bible says it's Jesus because he's the chief cornerstone of the temple of God. And all of us then are here and we make up this temple. So your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. And you are one of many stones, one of many bricks that make up the temple of God. And we are all supported by Jesus as the foundation. Listen, God's promise, God's promise is that the temple of God, which you are a part of, will always be defended, and it will never be destroyed again. And we know the physical temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. We know that the second temple was rebuilt. We know that there were some additions made by Herod, but we know also in 70 AD that it was also destroyed. There is a temple that will never be destroyed, and that is the temple of God that is Jesus, and we are built on, on that foundation. God's promise is that it will never, ever, ever be destroyed again. Have you thought about this in relation to your faith? Like, faith is a very individual thing, right? It's between me and God, people say. And I get that, and I understand that, and that's not incorrect. But, but as much as it is a personal decision... An individual decision to follow Jesus, it's not always, not always easy to see this, but you belong to a greater, a greater work of art. This is a tough, this is a really reaching here, but pretend this is an amazing work of art. You belong to a greater work of art that stands for the goodness. Listen, stands for the goodness, and it's called the church. And it stands for the goodness and the glory and the mercy and the hope and the future of the kingdom of God. It's not the physical temple of the past, but the spiritual temple of the present where Jesus sits on the throne. Amen? Amen. Jesus is on the throne. Here's your third and final point. God's work done in the name of Jesus is always bigger than the results that we can see. Hold on to that hope. Hold on to that hope that he is always with you because you are God's masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece, a work of art in Jesus' name. All right, let's finish this next section of Haggai because there's a transition here. There's a transition here where Haggai begins to prophesy uh, about the future. And I really want you to see this. It's so cool. In Haggai chapter 2, starting in verse 6. It says this, scripture says this, for this is what the Lord of heaven, remember, he said, remember, remember what I did when I brought you out of Egypt. Now in verse six, it says, for this is what the Lord of heaven's army says. In just a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth, the oceans and the dry land. I will shake all the nations and the treasures, the desire of all nations will be to, will be brought to this temple. I will fill this place with glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of heaven's armies. The future of this glory, the future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And this is the place I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven, have spoken. Remember, listen, these temples 
in the Old Testament. These temples were not only an important reminder, right, of the presence of God with his people, because this is the, 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 the illustration. This is God with his people, um, and this is how he chose to do so. But, but they're also, also a, a center, a center of social, economic, and sacrificial commerce. I mean, it was not just a thing, the temple. It was not just part of their culture. It was the center of it. It was the very center of the culture for the Hebrew people. Now, we can look at this passage, and we can assume that Haggai is talking about this second temple, this one that they're currently building. But he's not. But he's not. I'll show you that in a minute. God often does two things through prophets. He does two things through prophets. And the first thing is this. He will give them truth for life in the present future. That's the time that they're living. So the prophet says, this is what's going to happen, and this is probably going to happen in your lifetime. But then prophets, like what's going on here in Haggai, they will give us something that will pull our attention into a future that we're uncertain. We don't know exactly when this is going to happen in particular. Now, some understand this prophecy in this way. I'm just going to give you two, two few points. And then I'm going to give you, uh, give you the right one. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I'll give you a couple of viewpoints. And I like to do this because sometimes people interpret things in different ways. But listen, some people you know, will say this. like They understand this prophecy to be about a millennial temple. So not to get too convoluted and crazy with you this morning. But this millennial temple is something that is uh, that the Bible says will be rebuilt. And it will be rebuilt by the Jewish people, and their sacrificial system will be reinstituted, and this will happen due, during a thousand-year period, right? Depending on your view, or you're a millennial or premillennial or whatever you feel, you know, then that when that's going to happen is really, you know, up in the air. That's a thousand-year time where this is going to be. This is the temple that some people believe that uh, Haggai is talking about, or God is talking about um, through Haggai. And I can see that there's some problems with it. I don't know how time you went to it at the moment. And it's interesting. But most scholars, most biblical scholars believe that this prophecy, and it would just marry up with so much else, because everything in the Old Testament points to Jesus, that this prophecy is actually about Jesus. In Matthew chapter 12, you don't have to go there, but Jesus is walking in a field with his disciples, right? And they're hungry. Because they're traveling evangelists. And traveling evangelists are always hungry. So you should feed them if you get an opportunity. They're walking in the fields, right? These fields with wheat. And the wheat's growing. And they're just kind of running their fingers through there. And they pick the chaffs of wheat. And they're hungry. So they eat these little, these little chaffs of wheat. These heads of grain. And the religious leaders are looking on because they're always following Jesus and his disciples. And they're always looking to try and catch Jesus and doing something wrong. And so they accuse them of breaking a law of the Sabbath. Not, not by eating, because there's nothing wrong with eating grain, but harvesting, right? They said, oh, this is a, a violation of uh, a religious law found in Deuteronomy. You're harvesting, you're working on the Sabbath. You can't do that. Jesus reminded them, right? Jesus reminded them about a story uh, in second in first Samuel 21 about King David where King David is on the run from Saul and he's got his men with him and they're hungry and the only thing to eat is the bread that's in the temple the consecrated bread for the priests in the temple it's the only thing he was running from Saul and the priest Elimelech he had to make he made, had to make a moral decision. He had to make a moral decision whether he was going to feed David and his starving men or not. And his decision, of course, was to do so. To take that bread and to feed them and to put new fresh bread in his place. He said, look, that supersedes. These starving men, these people that are in need of bread, listen, that's more important than this ceremonial obligation. Right? He made that decision. In essence, Jesus is saying, look, Listen, religious leaders of the day. Listen, Pharisees. You have a narrow field of vision. You just are not seeing it. You have a narrow field of vision regarding the temple law. And because of that, you're missing the message that I am bringing. Jesus said, I am bringing a message of grace and I am bringing a message of mercy. When people are hungry, 
You feed them. I'm here to feed them, Jesus says. Let them eat. Let them eat. Jesus proclaims this. Listen, this is so important. Matthew 12, 6. He says this. I'll tell you that someone greater than, he, than, than the temple is here. So they're so stuck on this temple. But he says, I tell you that someone greater than the temple is here. Haggai 2, 7. This is where I want to connect it. Are you with me still? Okay, good. So Haggai 2, 7, right? It says the treasure or the desire of all nations will be brought to the, de to the temple. What's the desire of the nation of Israel? They're looking for the Messiah. I mean, this is what they've been doing throughout the whole Old Testament. They're trying to look for the Messiah. They're so excited about this. Everything they do seemingly is for this, this forward thinking about the future and the hope of a Messiah. The desire of all nations will be brought to the temple. The desire is Jesus. The desire is Jesus. The glory is Jesus. The wealth of nations is Jesus. The temple that Haggai is prophesying about is Jesus. Do you remember, listen, in Jesus' famous angry moment, right? Everybody likes this one. Where Jesus gets angry, he's in the temple and... They're making, like, they've turned, they've turned it into this bartering system, right? Because you, you have to get spotless animals, and they sell spotless animals, and you've got to pay for them. And, you know, and there's just trading going on. He says, why have you turned my father's house into a den of thieves? And then he flips over the money changers' tables, and then they come and they confront him. And they confront him. And remember Jesus' famous line. He says, he says, I tell you what, you destroy the temple. Destroy the temple, and in three days, I will rise. In three days, I will build it. In three days, it will be back. What? No way. Now they know he's crazy. Like, no way. That's not going to happen. I mean, think about all of the labor and toiling it took to get the temple to this point, right? First, first temple, second temple, parents temple. Now that's where we're at. They're like, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Not physically possible. For in three days, this temple can be rebuilt. Well, that's because he wasn't talking about that temple. He was talking about himself. He was talking about himself. Listen, they did attempt to destroy him. They attempted to destroy him by crucifying him on Calvary's cross. Then what happened? Or you don't have to guess. You don't have to guess because Haggai 2.6 says that I will again shake the earth and the heavens. Do you know that when Christ died on Calvary's cross, that there was a great earthquake, and the veil in the temple, the holy of holies, was split from the top to the bottom. Absolutely unbelievable fulfillment of prophecy, right there, right there. In Haggai, I will again shake the earth and heavens. The first time, listen, the first time that this happened was on Mount Sinai, when God gave the people the law. When God gave Moses the commandments, the second time he did this is when he gave the world, listen, when he gave us Jesus, the fulfillment of that law. Okay, we got, we got to go. We're running out of time. This is so good. I could talk for the team. Come on up. I've got so much more. There's so much more that we can say, and we're going to continue this stuff. We're going to continue this in Haggai. There's more to be said, but everything that needs to be said, needs to be said today, I think has been said. So we're going to share more truth from God's word next week, but I want to be able to pray with you now because I want to pray for you if you are struggling in an area of your life. You made it a point to come here to church this morning to hear from God's word prayerfully. I pray that God spoke to you in and through it, and maybe God is putting something on your heart right now, and I want to miss an opportunity to pray for you as we go out and you head into this week. So if you would bow your heads and pray with me. And we just go before the Lord. We go before the Lord and just say, God, God, we are so thankful for who you are. We are just in awe of your grace and your glory, God. We are so thankful that, that we don't have to go to a physical temple to worship you. That you literally have created your temple within us, God. That you have placed your Holy Spirit within us. And we walk around in relationship with you every day. That's why, God, when we struggle through the things 
that we struggle through, we know and we can declare that you are with us and we can be strong. If you're here today and you are struggling in any area of your life, whether you're watching online or you're sitting in this room, if you're struggling in any of your area of your life, I don't believe that you are listening to this message, which I hope was encouraging to you by accident. I think God has something for you. And he wants to take you from one place to another. He wants to take you from whatever issue you have. And he wants to take you into a new place. A new place of comfort. A new place of hope. A new place of healing. That's the God we serve. That's what Jesus does. He, he met and ate with sinners, but he never stayed there. And he never left them if he could. He gave them an opportunity to move forward. God, I pray for each and every person here today, God, that the Holy Spirit would move inside of them, that you would stir up the Spirit inside of them, that they would see things that they haven't seen before, that they would move in ways that they haven't seen before. God, we know you are stirring the hearts for people around this country. We are seeing revival happen in other areas. We are praying that this will happen here in our midst, God, if it is your will. We pray, God, we pray, God, that you would draw us closer to you. And that you would draw us closer to you as we continue to focus and to be steadfast with you. If you're here today and you have never you have never, if this is foreign to you, and you have never heard this, this explanation of how there's this problem in our lives that's sin, and there's this solution that's called Jesus, and Jesus can take this problem that you have, and he can cast it as far as the east is from the west, and the only thing you need to do is believe on him. As you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord, and he is the Lord of your life. And you have access to all of these incredible promises that we've been talking about. If that's you, you just say, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, that same Spirit is convicting your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Lord Jesus, make me a new creation in you. I pray, God, that you meet me where I'm at today. If that's you, you become a believer in Jesus, and we want to welcome you to the family of God, and we want to help you on a journey that you're about to start. God, we love you. God, we honor you. God, we praise you. In Jesus' name.